the court was empty, the campus saddened, the flag at half-mast. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 20 horribly tragic sports deaths. He's the only NHL player to die as a direct result of injuries suffered in an NHL game. For this list, we'll be focusing on the most horrific tragedies that have occurred during sporting games, resulting in the deaths of athletes and or spectators. As such, we won't be including fatalities that happened outside the field, such as the 1972 Andes flight disaster. Jesus! What has been your most devastating loss in sports history? Let us know in the comments. Albert Ibusi Bujungu. Albert Ibusi Bujungu got his professional start playing for soccer clubs in his hometown of Douala, Cameroon. In 2013, he moved to Algeria after being signed by JS Kabali, a club based in Tizi Ouzou. On August 23, 2014, Bujugu met a tragic end following his team's loss to the visiting USM Alger. As the players exited the field, the 24-year-old was reportedly struck in the head by an object thrown from the stands. He was rushed to the hospital and pronounced dead a few hours later. This cause of death remains disputed. However, as an independent pathologist hired by Bujungu's family described his wounds as consistent with a close-range attack, this suggests that the soccer player may have been murdered. Lane Frost Right from an early age, Lane Frost had already begun riding dairy calves. Once he was done with high school, he became a professional bull rider and earned multiple titles throughout his career. In 1989, Frost competed at the Cheyenne Frontier Days Rodeo in Wyoming with a Brahma bull named Taken Care of Business. Frost was thrown off the bull after successfully completing an 85-point ride, but it turned and hit him with its horns, causing severe internal injuries. He later succumbed to these injuries at a nearby hospital. This man's life has touched us all. He'll be greatly missed. Frost's death was a significant shock to the rodeo community and prompted the mandatory use of protective gear for riders. In 2017, he was posthumously inducted into the Bull Riding Hall of Fame. If it is true that a man's wealth is to be measured by how much he was loved, then Lane Frost was a very wealthy man. A champion in the arena, a champion in life. Jack Trice. Back in the early 1920s, Jack Trice became the first African-American athlete to compete for Iowa State University, then known as Iowa State College. Trice played tackle for the team, but his life was cut short during his second ever college game. Going up against the University of Minnesota, Trice suffered an injury to his collarbone during the second play. He continued the game only to be trampled upon by three of his opponents after an unsuccessful tackle. As best as we can tell, a runner was following two blockers. Trice jumped in there, did a roll block to take out the blocker so his teammates could make the tackle. Trice was taken to the hospital where he was cleared to travel back home with the rest of his team. However, he sustained multiple internal injuries and passed on two days later. He was only 21 at the time of his death. It cuts beyond uh, racial boundaries. It tells you that we're, we're all together in this thing we call life. We come, we journey through it, and we leave. And uh, it doesn't have anything to do with race. Becky Zerlantis. In addition to being a college professor, Becky Zerlantis was a dedicated sportswoman who was proficient at martial arts, synchronized swimming, ice skating, and boxing. Zerlantis was a lightweight boxer who had clinched a regional Golden Gloves title in 2002. Three years later, she returned for what was meant to be her retirement bout in the Colorado State Boxing Senior Female Championships. In the third round, Zerlantis was knocked unconscious by her opponent, Heather Schmitz, who landed a blow to her left temple. She eventually died the following day as a result of blunt force trauma. The tragic incident made Zerlantis the first female boxer to lose her life in a U.S. sanctioned match. Alexei Cherepanov At just 19, Russian ice hockey player Alexei Cherepanov was already showing great promise in the sport. By 2008, he was a right winger for the Russian professional team Avangard Omsk and had been selected in the first NHL draft the previous year by the New York Rangers. But before Cherepanov could ever play for his American team, he died during an avant-garde game in October 2008. Just as the match was nearing its end, Cherepanov moved to the bench and slumped. All attempts to resuscitate him proved futile. The promising star was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. It was later revealed that Cherepanov suffered from a heart condition, which was kept secret by avant-garde officials. Ray Chapman. He never took first base. He, he, he fell to the ground at first and he kind of got back up. Uh, couldn't speak, uh, fell down again, and they took him to the hospital. Today, baseball batters are required to wear helmets during a game to prevent any serious or fatal injuries as a result of being hit by a pitch. This rule was put in place partly due to the tragic death of then Cleveland Indians player Ray Chapman. In August 1920, Chapman's team was playing against the New York Yankees at the Polo Grounds in Upper Manhattan. Yankees pitcher Carl Mays threw a spitball that struck Chapman in the head, sending him to the ground. When the ball hit Chapman in the head, it hit him with such force that it could be heard throughout the stadium, and the ball actually ricocheted back onto the playing field, and Carl Mays thought the ball had hit the bat, and he fielded it like it was a bunt. 
He was carried off the field and later died of brain damage at the hospital. Chapman's death had a profound impact on the sport, resulting in Major League Baseball outlawing spitballs and eventually mandating the use of helmets. Hank Gathers Hank Gathers was a 23-year-old 6'7 college star, playing basketball for Loyola Marymount University's men's team. Gathers, who was a collegiate All-American star, was undergoing treatment for a publicly known heart problem at the time. Although the medication initially affected his play, he gradually bounced back after his dosage was reduced. The Lions were on track to become the highest scoring team in D1 ever. However, during the West Coast Conference Tournament semifinals on March 4, 1990, Gathers collapsed on the court after scoring a slam dunk. Despite regaining consciousness briefly, he was taken to a nearby hospital where he ultimately passed away. Gathers' teammates, after witnessing his last basket and collapse Sunday night, struggled with the reality of losing their leader. In his honor, the Loyola Marymount Lions went on to make an impressive run in that season's NCAA tournament, reaching the regional finals. Antoine Hubert. In 2019, French professional racing driver Antoine Hubert made his Formula 2 debut, clinching early wins in Monaco and France. Having already won the GP3 championship the previous year, Hubert was seen as a rising star in the world of motorsport. Sadly, on August 31, 2019, his life was cut short following a crash during the spa Francorchamps Formula 2 feature race in Stavelot, Belgium. The Frenchman's death is the first driver fatality at a Formula 1 race weekend since Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger were killed in 1994. On the second lap of the race, Hubert's car was involved in a high-speed collision with that of Juan Manuel Correa. The impact was so severe that it tore both cars apart and caused significant injuries to Hubert and Correa. Despite the best efforts of the medical team, Hubert succumbed to his injuries later that day. Antoine was happiest at a racetrack and with his family. His death has devastated the entire motorsport community. It robs the world of a humble, vibrant, intelligent and passionate 22-year-old who can never be replaced. He will be deeply missed. Caleb Moore Although he got his start as an ATV racer, Caleb Moore switched to snowmobiles and quickly rose to the top of the sport. He was a frequent competitor at the Winter X Games, winning three bronze and one silver medal in three years. While participating in the 2013 edition, Moore attempted a backflip while riding his snowmobile. However, he under-rotored and was thrown off, only to be hit right after by the descending vehicle. It was initially reported that he had suffered a concussion, but on getting to the hospital, it was revealed that he had also been bleeding around his heart. Moore's condition worsened over the next few days, and he eventually passed away on January 31st, 2013. Saying just weeks before X Games Aspen 2013, I wake up every morning and I work out. I try to eat healthier, I don't go out. I'm strictly focused on trying to reach that holy grail of a gold medal. Marco Simoncelli. The untimely death of Italian professional motorcycle racer Marco Simoncelli cut short a promising career and certainly left a void in the sport. Simoncelli, who began racing professionally at the age of nine, met his end at the 2011 Malaysian Grand Prix in Sepang. During the second lap of the race, the 24-year-old lost control of his bike and slid across the tarmac right into the path of two other riders, Colin Edwards and Valentino Rossi. Both men collided with Simoncelli, knocking off his helmet and leaving him with severe injuries. He was rushed to the facility's medical center where he was later pronounced dead. Our sympathies go to his family and, and uh, we, we want to show every respect uh, possible to, to Marco. Rossi, who was a close friend of Simoncelli, launched the VR46 Racing Academy in his honor. What are your goals with the academy? Try to win uh, the MotoGP Championship. Benny Kid Perret. On March 24, 1962, welterweight champion Benny Kid Perret had to defend his title against his fierce rival, Emil Griffith. Perret and Griffith were meeting for the third time after each winning once in their previous two bouts. In the 12th round, Griffith delivered a series of punches to Perret's head, knocking him unconscious before the referee intervened. Unfortunately, Perret fell into a coma and never regained consciousness. He died 10 days later due to massive brain hemorrhaging. As a result of the incident, TV networks stopped broadcasting boxing matches regularly for years, and many even debated over the legitimacy of the sport. It also had a lasting impact on Griffith, who reportedly struggled with guilt over Perret's death. Are you the kid, son? But I want you to know that it's, um, there's no hard feelings here, and... Sarah Burke. 
A pioneer in women's freestyle skiing, Sarah Burke won five gold medals for the Superpipe event at the Winter X Games. She was also instrumental in getting the sport recognized by the International Olympic Committee and added to the Winter Olympics. She's brought the sport to a whole new level, to a, a level where um, the girls today are, are chasing her and, and wanting to, to do what she's done, but it's going to be the, the fact of the matter is you're not going to find many athletes out there that can bring what Sarah's brought to the sport. However, just two years before she could ever make it to the world stage, tragedy struck. Burke was training in Park City, Utah on January 10, 2012, when she landed on her head after attempting a trick. What seemed to be a minor accident actually ruptured a critical artery that sent her into cardiac arrest. Despite undergoing surgery to repair the damage, Burke passed away nine days later. She was posthumously inducted into the Canadian Olympic Hall of Fame. One thing is clear. No one is questioning the legacy of Sarah Burke. Bill Masterton. Born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Bill Masterton once led the U.S. ice hockey team and played center for the Minnesota North Stars. But despite making strides in the sport, Masterton tragically lost his life after a fatal head injury on January 13, 1968. During a game against the Oakland Seals, Masterton collided with two of his opponents and smashed his head against the ice in the resulting fall. They hit him so hard, uh, some of them, even some of the players even thought he was out before he hit the ice. As he was without a helmet, the impact caused him to lose consciousness and he ultimately passed away two days later. Although his death brought attention to the importance of safety gear, it took 11 years before helmets became mandatory for all NHL players. The Masterton Trophy is awarded each year to the player who best exemplifies sportsmanship, perseverance, and dedication to the game. Qualities displayed every day of Bill Masterton's life. Philip Hughes. With impressive runs in domestic and international sporting events, 25-year-old Australian cricketer Philip Hughes had a bright future ahead. As a batsman, Hughes had guts, if not always grace. That was sadly dimmed on November 25, 2014, while he was batting in a domestic match at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Hughes attempted a hook shot to a bouncer, but missed and was hit in the neck by the ball. Despite wearing a helmet, the ball struck just below the protective gear, causing a vertebral artery dissection that resulted in a brain hemorrhage. Hughes was placed in a coma and passed away just three days before his 26th birthday. In the wake of his death, modifications were made to the batting helmets, although it is disputed if the new design would have prevented Hughes' accident. Owen Hart. This is not a wrestling angle. This is real life. Born into the Hart wrestling dynasty, Owen Hart built upon his father's reputation, becoming one of the best known performers in the then WWF. Hart developed a masked superhero alter ego called the Blue Blazer, which he employed often in his performances. On May 23, 1999, Hart appeared as the Blue Blazer for the Over the Edge pay-per-view event. As part of his entrance, he was lowered into the ring from the ceiling. However, the equipment malfunctioned, causing Hart to fall 78 feet. Medical personnel immediately rushed to his aid, and he was taken to the Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, where he was pronounced dead. Hart's family filed a lawsuit against the WWF, which was reportedly settled for $18 million. But many in the arena had no idea what was really going on. I thought he was, you know, doing some stuff when he hit the rope, you know, I knew something wrong. Ayrton Senna. A widely celebrated racer, Ayrton Senna was a Brazilian driver who was a three-time Formula One world champion. Senna was leading the race at the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix in Italy when he suddenly veered off the track at high speed and crashed into a concrete wall. The impact caused fatal head injuries and despite efforts to revive him, he was pronounced dead later that day. Ayrton ran out of luck. He did not have a broken bone in his body. He did not have any bruising. If that piece of assembly would have gone six inches higher or six inches lower, he would have walked back to the paddock. Senna's death came just one day after fellow racer Roland Ratzenberger also suffered a fatal accident on the same track during a qualifying session. Their deaths had a significant impact in the world of motorsport, leading to significant changes in safety standards and regulations in Formula One. He died doing something that he desperately wanted to do, and I don't think he would have wished it any, any other way. He was special, I mean, he was not one step, he was two steps better than everyone else. Nodar Kumari Tashvili often performed at incredibly high speed. Luge is considered one of the most dangerous Olympic sports. In 2010, Georgian luge athlete Nodar Kumari Tashvili was set to make his debut at the Winter Olympic Games. Mere hours before the opening ceremony on February 12th, Kumari Tashvili was participating in a training run when he lost control of his luge and was thrown into an unprotected steel pole. And I think the case could be made that we were warned and we did nothing. Medical staff at the track and a local hospital tried to resuscitate Kumar Tashvili, but he later passed away from his injuries. 
The incident raised several questions about the safety of the luge track, resulting in changes to the walls and support beams. Kumaratashvili's memory was honored at the opening ceremony just hours later. Dale Earnhardt a seven-time NASCAR Cup Series champion, Dale Earnhardt was a legend in the racing circuit. As a result, his widely broadcast death devastated millions of fans around the world. During the final lap of the 2001 Daytona 500 race, Earnhardt was involved in a three-car accident alongside other drivers Sterling Marlin and Ken Schrader. His car was slammed into the wall at an estimated speed of up to 160 miles per hour leaving him with fatal injuries. Earnhardt was rushed to the Halifax Medical Center in Daytona Beach, where he was pronounced dead due to a basilar skull fracture. And then we followed, watched the ambulance going to the hospital, and the ambulance was traveling virtually at walking pace, which meant either a broken back or death. His death sent shockwaves through the racing community and led NASCAR to implement several safety measures, such as the use of head and neck restraints. Somehow, fans say this man in the black number three Chevrolet always seemed to defy the risks of this sport. His death, a reminder to the men who still want to be boys that NASCAR at 180 miles per hour is not make-believe. Benichati team. In October 1998, two rival soccer teams in the Democratic Republic of Congo were tied up in an intense match. The Benichati team were hosting the visiting Basanga players in a game with a score of 1-1 to -one for both sides. Then, right in the middle of the match, a bolt of lightning reportedly struck the field, killing all 11 Benichati players. Roughly 30 other people suffered varying degrees of burns, but surprisingly, all members of the Basanga team came out unscathed. As a result, many believe that the Basanga team may have turned to witchcraft and dark magic to help eliminate their opponents. These claims, however, remain unfounded. We pray of thee. We invoke thee. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. 1955 Le Mans Disaster It remains the single worst disaster in the history of motorsport, as it claimed the lives of not only a racer but also dozens of spectators. On June 11, 1955, at the 24 hours of Le Mans motor race in France, driver Pierre Levesque was driving a Mercedes-Benz 300 SLR, one of the fastest cars in the race. Around the fourth hour of the event, Levesque hit a much slower car driven by Mike Hawthorne, sending him through the air and into the spectator area. You inside, now! The debris, clear the track for the drivers! The impact caused the car to burst into flames, launching debris into the packed crowd, which killed 84 people, including Levesque, and injured many more. It led to significant reforms in the designs of racetracks and racing cars. 